Um, I think uh, we can kick off uh, our event today. Uh, I want to uh, say a warm uh, hello and welcome to all of our participants uh, around the globe, literally, uh, to the launch event uh, of the Compendium on Human Rights of the Armed Forces Personnel. Uh, I want to uh, say that this is a, an event that has been jointly organized by ODIR and DCAF. And as you may uh, be used to uh, by now, before starting uh, today's discussion, I need to go through a few housekeeping uh, rules, but this will be very brief, uh, bear with us, just to make uh, sure that the event runs smoothly. So please uh, take these uh, issues into account and bear with us in case we face any technical difficulties, although of course, I hope that we won't. Um, just to say first that the session will be recorded, um, but uh, only the speakers will be seen and heard, not um, you as the participants. We do have interpretation uh, between Russian and English. You may know this function, but in case you don't, uh, if you go to the bottom uh, of your Zoom screen, you will find a little icon that says interpretation. If you click on that, you can select the language in which you want to hear um, this event. Questions can be submitted. You may be used to this function as well. But there's also a little button at the bottom of your screen uh, for Q&A. You can insert uh, your questions here. If they are directed to a specific speaker, you can indicate so. Uh, and you can also uh, like uh, the questions that have been posted by other participants. Um, that is uh, a nice um, interactive feature, but it will also help us prioritize the questions in the Q&A session. So um, maybe during the event, follow uh, what questions are posted. And if there are any that you also would like uh, for the speakers to answer, uh, you can like them in the course of the event. We are very, very excited about the big interest um, that the event has attracted, even beyond the borders of the OSE region. And I want to welcome you uh, all very warmly, uh, a good afternoon or evening um, or morning, depending on the time zone from which you are joining us. We are also very spoiled by high level introducers and speakers, which I will introduce uh, to you as we're going along. And at first, I want to introduce to you uh, Ambassador Tina Mörk-Smith, um, the ambassador uh, to, uh, of Norway to the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, ambassador, thank you so much. It is so good of you to uh, join us despite uh, the session uh, of the Human Rights Council already going on. So no doubt you will be very uh, busy. Thank you for joining us and the floor for your opening remark is yours. Thank you so much and thank you, Andrea. This is it's such a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you for joining the launch of the OSCE ODIR DCAF Human Rights of Armed Forces Personnel Compendium of Standards, Good Practices and Recommendations. It's a pleasure for Norway to be part of this project. Human rights and democratic principles are at the heart of Norwegian foreign policy. Our main channels for achieving results are by working multilaterally through the UN and through regional organizations like the OVCC and the Council of Europe. Human rights of all persons must be respected, regardless of their gender, religion or belief, sexual orientation, age, disability, ethnicity, or even their job. This also accounts for our armed forces. Soldiers are citizens too, and their human rights must not be unjustly restricted. The issue of soldiers and their human rights is often overlooked, as we instead focus on ensuring that armed forces respect the human rights of others they engage with. Yet, if we are to do right by others, we need to be to do right by ourselves first. Norway is committed to promoting human rights and in doing so, we wish to lead by example. Therefore, I'm pleased to see that Norway is highlighted for good practices in the compendium. To mention some examples, civil and political rights of soldiers are recognized in law. There are guidelines to ensure freedom of expression and freedom of association. We have gender equality in conscription and there is an ombuds institution for the armed forces. Successful security sector reform requires attention to human rights. 
The purpose of security sector reform is to rebuild and reform the armed forces, the intelligence service, and the justice sector in countries emerging from conflict or authoritarian rule. The reforms are intended to ensure that the security structures are under democratic control and are transparent and accountable in line with good governance norms. The compendium is a useful tool for promoting human rights standards and good practices in the OSSC region for states that are in the process of reforming their security sectors. And it is also a useful compilation of information for those of us who are not in the business of reforming our security sectors, but who strive to continuously improve our own systems. The OSCE and the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights are important partners for Norway in contributing to the human the, to promotion of human rights in Europe. Odu's mission is very simple. We, the participating states, establish it to assist us in ensuring full respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, the rule of law, and all other human dimension commitments. As a part of this mandate, ODIR is to monitor our compliance with these commitments and assist us in ensuring that our measures uphold human rights, democratic principles, and the rule of law. The OSCE's work on security sector governance and reform and women, peace and security is highly important. The OSCE contributes not only to enhance security and safety for the population of its member states, but also to strengthen the ability of the security sectors to protect fundamental freedoms and human rights, as well as upholding the rule of law. Norway also has a long and successful history of cooperation with DCAF, working on issues such as human rights, good governance, and security sector reform to complement its efforts with the OSCE. This compendium is the result of Norwegian financial support to DCAF to support the promotion, protection, and enforcement of human rights and fundamental freedoms of armed forces personnel in the OSCE region. I appreciate both ODIR's and DCAF's support and the excellent work that went into produce, to producing this impressive compendium. So thank you so much for asking me to be part of this today. I'm really looking forward to listening to the discussion. Thank you, Andrea, back to you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for, for laying the ground really uh, to what the compendium is and why it is so uh, unique and, and important. Um, and with that, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Matteo Mekace, the new director of UDIR, who has also agreed to uh, deliver opening remarks. We're very grateful to you, director. Uh, please uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you, Ambassador Smith, for your kind words about this work uh, that we have done together with the Geneva Center for Security sector governance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is a real pleasure to, to welcome you today and thank you for joining us for the launch of what represents for dear one of our public or our most important publication. I wish to thank for first of all, all the states uh, which have contributed to uh, the realization of this publication. Uh, naturally those which have provided good practices which are listed in the uh, compendium and naturally also those uh, which have supported financially this effort and uh, has made us uh, you know, has made it possible to make it available uh, to you all. In this regard, I want to thank again uh, the government of Norway, from which we have just heard, but also the government of Finland and uh, whose representatives will help us today in the conducting of the event, both uh, at the opening and also uh, at the closing session. Um, I want to thank again the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance for joining us in this effort. Uh, it is a longtime partner over there. Uh, 15 years ago, we joined forces to, publi to publish uh, the uh, predecessor of this compendium, which was a handbook. And I know that since then we have enjoyed good cooperation. So I want to thank you also for that. Ladies and gentlemen, the OSCE is a unique forum. Uh, for its comprehensive concept of security, where the three dimensions are mutually supported. But there are not many cases in which the three dimensions are truly interlinked. But this is certainly the case when it comes to the human rights of armed force personnel. The armed forces play a very important role in upholding democratic and um, democratic state and society as a secure environment 
is essential for citizens to be able to exercise their rights and freedom, and also for the rule of law to be respected. Armed forces are bound to respect the human rights in the exercise of their duties. So it is also very important that their human rights are respected within their institutions, whether they are in the barracks or during military operations. The OIC Code of Conduct on Political Military Aspects of Security was the first OIC document to include a firm commitment to ensure that the human rights of armed forces personnel would be respected. To put it simply, armed force personnel are citizens in uniform with the same rights as their peers, but with some subjects subject to certain limitations and duties imposed by the military service. In this respect, we have seen some progress over the last 15 years, and the compendium lists these achievements, as well as the evolving security landscape and the threats that we face. But let me also give some example of the progress that we have achieved. Some states, for example, have established a minimum age of 18 years old for voluntary recruitment. Others have lifted limits to the right of freedom of association within the military. Others have opened all military arms to women and have taken an outspoken and strong stance against sexual violence in the military. In October last year, ODU conducted a two week online dialogue on harassment, violence, and abuses within armed forces, which put the spotlight on how these are still widespread and on the work that needs to be done. There is also an increasing recognition that armed forces will be more integrated and effective if they reflect the broader diversity of society. And we have seen some progress also in this respect. But there is still a long way to go to make sure that all ethnic, racial, linguistic, and other minorities enjoy representation within the armed forces of all OSC participating states. As military personnel are expected to respect human rights in their exercise of their duties, they need to be able to distinguish between a legal order from one that is not aligned with international law. And in this regard, it is critical that the culture of respect for human rights becomes a key component of military culture. The compendium provides recommendations on 18 topics, from civil and political rights to equal opportunity and non-discrimination, from human rights education to military justice. And today, we will hear from some of the experts who wrote this publication, as well as from key partners in our efforts to make sure that the human rights for all our forces personnel are respected. I thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you very, very much, uh, Director, for uh, providing the context and how uh, this compendium fits and where it sits in the OSCE framework. Um, and um, uh, on that occasion, since you mentioned the online uh, dialogue, also that's a good uh, opportunity for me to thank everyone who contributed uh, to this dialogue, uh, which was organized in the course of, of, of two weeks. And it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce to you also for opening remarks, um, uh, Thomas Gruber, uh, Gruber sorry, um, director of the CAF. Uh, and on this occasion, let me stress uh, our, our strong long-standing partnership with DCAF, not just on this compendium, but also on other uh, topics. And on this occasion, if I may blatantly advertise uh, the Gender and Security Toolkit, which has also been um, published in cooperation between our two organizations and UN Women. I hope you forgive me for this recommendation for your uh, reading list. Uh, and with this, um, I'm passing on uh, to Director Gerber. Um, the screen is yours. Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, uh, I understand that uh, we have a truly global audience today. So a very good uh, afternoon, morning or evening to all of you from wherever in the world you're joining us. Thank you for making time for this uh, launch of the publication, uh, the OSCE ODIR uh, Human Rights of Armed Forces Personnel Compendium of Standards, Good Practices and Recommendations. Let me first of all also extend a warm welcome and my sincere congratulations to Mr. Matteo Megacci on his recent appointment as new director of ODIR. 
DCAF and, and Olir have indeed worked very closely ever since DCAF was created in 2000. And I, I do greatly look forward to continuing this great partnership with you, uh, Matteo, if, if I may, and your office for many more years to come. Let me also, from my side, uh, thank the governments of Canada, Finland and Norway for their invaluable financial support, which has made this compendium possible. Human rights are of critical importance to DCAF. Our mission is to make states and people safer within a framework of democratic governance, the rule of law and respect for human rights. And while the armed forces play a unique role when it comes to providing security in a state, their members, just like ordinary citizens, are entitled to enjoy human rights and fundamental freedoms, of course. This is what is encapsulated in the concept of citizens in uniforms. But members of armed forces should not only be beneficiaries of human rights, if they can operate within an environment and a culture in which they themselves see and personally experience the value of fair and equitable access to human rights, and in which appropriate investments are made to ensure that every person in uniform understands his or her rights, these members themselves will be much more likely to respect human rights of others, both at home or during foreign deployments. It is general knowledge, I would say, that certain rights of armed forces personnel can, under certain circumstances, be limited on the grounds of national security. However, these uh, limitations must always obviously meet strict requirements of legality, proportionality, non-discrimination and necessity. And our new compendium looks into precisely these requirements and offers reliable guidance as to what are acceptable and viable approaches, standards and good practices and recommendations regarding this issue. In 2008, DCAF and Odier published the then called Handbook on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms of Armed Forces Personnel, which uh, previous speakers have already mentioned, which at the time offered the first comprehensive analysis of the rights of armed forces personnel. After the handbook was published, we undertook a series of activities to put the lessons from the handbook into action by organizing workshops, trainings and conferences at both national and international levels. The handbook was used quite extensively and has quite significantly also, I should say, contributed to academic discourse on this particular aspect of human rights law and practice. It was uh, maybe as a consequence translated into nine additional languages so that decision makers, academics, practitioners from within and outside of armed forces could make use of it in different local contexts. And could also incorporate it, I should add, more easily into training curricula for new cadets. As it was used by very different target audiences, and I should maybe add to this list, ministries of defense, parliaments, civil society organizations, or military associations, we would argue that it was able to make quite a powerful contribution to advancing respect for human rights of armed forces personnel. The compendium we're launching today builds on the foundation established by the 2008 handbook, of course. But we've integrated into it a comprehensive review and update on how human rights law and practice in the OSCE region has evolved since 2008. Many laws have changed as many countries have further shifted away from more narrow concepts of human rights, which were predominant in the era of the Cold War. We've also seen quite a significant evolution as regards the role of the armed forces within society at large. In the compendium, we've tried to capture and meaningfully integrate all these evolutions. This also includes new areas which have come into focus as a result of more recent technological and societal developments. For instance, how can or should armed forces handle possible tensions between wanting to uphold freedom of expression at a time when each soldier has easy access to social media and 
on the other hand, protecting the legitimate interest and need to control the circulation of sensitive military information. To give you another example, in the compendium, there is a new focus on the rights of veterans. This is also a reflection of the growing acceptance that armed forces have a duty and an obligation of care to their personnel long after their members have left service. And finally, although it's not a new aspect, the compendium captures the significant advancements made over the past decade and a half as regards the inclusion of women and LBGTI personnel in the armed forces. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, following today's launch of the compendium, we're planning to actively disseminate this new reference book through appropriate activities and channels. We're also exploring the option of, again, translating the compendium or specific parts of it into different languages, as we did in 2008. We're determined to do what we can to make sure that this new publication becomes an indispensable tool in the toolbox of all armed forces and all organizations and individuals working with such forces. I hope that you and your organizations will read and use the compendium and that you will play an active part also in sensitizing other stakeholders and partners to do the same. Before closing, let me thank you for your interest, your commitment, and also your future contributions to further strengthening the respect for human rights in the armed forces. Thank you very much for your attention and back to you, Andrea. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Gerber, um, for uh, this background and also for the examples that really flesh out what the compendium is about and make, make it more concrete. Um, I think uh, the three opening remarks were really much more than just opening remarks, but did introduce uh, the compendium where it sits in the context of democratic values, human rights, security sector reform. So I think we had a very, very good um, introduction already into the topic. Thank you to all three opening speakers. And as the uh, ambassador uh, Smith has alluded to, um, when we think about human rights and military, the first thing that uh, usually is, comes to mind is the responsibility of armed forces, personnel, um, uh, in terms of complying with international human rights law. But of course, human rights are there for everyone uh, and also to military personnel. Uh, and um, this is part of instilling the culture of human rights as well in military. Um, because it's uh, more understandable that you should respect the human rights of others if there is also attention to the human rights of yourself. Um, and like we have heard during the opening remarks today, we are launching this uh, important publication that guides decision makers in a very, very comprehensive form uh, in making this uh, institutional culture shift happen and respecting the human rights of military forces personnel. The compendium is very comprehensive. I don't know whether you had the chance to uh, browse through it. It is on our website and DCAF's website, and it has 18 thematic topics that it uh, captures in five sections. Let me just start uh, by uh, running you very, very briefly through, these, uh, through the content uh, before I call on our expert speakers. So first, um, the regulatory framework is laid out, the standards, for human rights in the armed forces. And this section um, provides the, the context, the legal context in national terms, but also international terms for the exercise of human rights by members of the armed forces. Second, importantly, the compendium focuses on the civil and political rights of armed forces personnel, including, as it was mentioned, uh, freedom of expression, association, conscientious objection, freedom of religion or belief. Thirdly, the compendium covers issues of equality and non-discrimination. And in particular, it deals with women service personnel, ethnic and national minorities, gender identity and sexual orientation. The fourth section looks at specific issues of military life, including recruitment and uh, selecting underage armed forces personnel, the proper treatment of armed forces personnel, and their working and living conditions. 
And the fifth and final section covers the important field of promoting and enforcing compliance with human rights in the barracks. It includes human rights education, military justice systems and ombuds institutions, and the responsibilities of commanders to hold individual soldiers accountable for their conduct. As you may have seen, uh, it is mostly or is to some extent a legal document, and it can be quite complex and dense in nature, but in an effort to uh, break this down, make it more digestible, accessible, and useful also for non-legal experts, we have uh, made a lot of effort to provide brief recommendations at the end of each chapter. Um, and there are also some boxes in which uh, practical examples are uh, explained on an illustrative basis. Usually those are good practices among OSCE participating states, which we hope you will find useful. And again, because of the length and complexity of compendium, um, the uh, two uh, staff members who were responsible um, for this um, updated publication, I've tried to make your real life as users easier by also producing short two summary uh, documents on each chapter. Um, we hope you find them useful as a starting point, and then you can always go into more detail in the compendium uh, or the other way around. Um, have a look uh, at all these tools which are on our website and the link will be posted uh, in the chat. Both the compendium and uh, the, uh, each of the two page uh, summaries. Um, for now, uh, we have the two pages in English only, but we're working on providing also a Russian versions, I should mention. Um, at this point, um, I, I am sure you won't mind uh, me expressing my gratitude also to the staff at ODIR and DCAF uh, who uh, have made this compendium uh, possible and the event today. Um, I want to uh, say a big thank you to William McDermott, who is the project coordinator at DCAF, and to Jona Naumann and one of our wonderful human rights officers at ODIR, um, who have been uh, working really hard in the last year to uh, make sure that uh, the compendium is uh, put together, uh, that relevant uh, stakeholders are consulted, that we have good practice examples, and that all of it is put together in a um, visually attractive and, and, and comprehensive and accessible um, publication. So thank you to uh, those two. Uh, but also let me thank you to our communications department who are also uh, play a big role in making this possible and the colleagues uh, who work in the background uh, organizing this event, uh, Alvaro Gomez del Val Ruiz and Merlit Jasper. I hope you uh, agree that we should give them a big hand uh, and thank you for organizing. Uh, and now, without uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce to you the speakers uh, today. As I've mentioned, one of them unfortunately could not join us. We wish her and her family all the best and hope she can join us some other time. Uh, but we have very exciting speakers, experts who have contributed extensively to this very compendium and who will um, introduce us a bit more in detail in what it contains. Um, and let me first um, introduce to you uh, Professor Ian Lee. Uh, he authored uh, seven chapters of the compendium, primarily on civil and political rights. Uh, he has also been a lead author in the predecessor um, of this compendium, the Handbook on Human Rights. Uh, and he's currently a professor at Durham University. Uh, professor, thank you for your support in making this uh, compendium possible. Uh, and the screen is yours to introduce uh, it to us. I, you just need to un, yes, I think now it's unmuted. Go ahead. Well, thank you uh, for your introduction and for the invitation to uh, contribute to this important event. Uh, in my remarks, I want to uh, say something about the origins uh, and the implications of the citizens in uniform approach, which has already been mentioned, uh, underlies uh, the handbook and work in this area. And the idea of citizens in uniform draws on several distinct sources, although what they have in common uh, is the idea of equality uh, between state officials here, of course, members of the armed forces and citizens in general. The expression citizen in uniform uh, was first termed in 19th century Britain 
uh, in relation to the newly established Metropolitan Police, not the armed forces. Uh, but later, uh, the uh, uh, famous constitutional uh, writer, A.V. Dicey, uh, applied the idea to the military in his discussion of martial law. The emphasis was on the power of uniform officials, power, I, I should stress. In the 20th century, though, the idea surfaces in US constitutional law in relation to the military, but with an important difference, this time referring to rights, not powers or duties. In 1962, uh, Justice Warren uh, wrote, our citizens in uniform may not be stripped of their basic rights simply because they have doffed civilian clothes. The idea, however, is not exclusively an Anglo-Saxon one by any means. Uh, in 20th century post-war Germany, uh, the idea of Staatsburger in uniform uh, was consciously adopted along with the principle of inner forum uh, in a leadership as one of the foundational concepts uh, for the reconstruction of the Bundeswehr. The objective of treating members of armed forces in this way was to inculcate civic values and a sense of political and moral responsibility that would safeguard against any repetition of uncritical obedience as it characterized, of course, the Nazi era. Particular constitutional guarantees accompanied these reforms, especially the creation of a parliamentary commissioner for armed forces, uh, which has served as the inspiration uh, for the introduction of military ombudsperson offices uh, in other countries. Now, this richer German version of citizens in uniform is perhaps the nearest conception that the OSCE draws on in its human dimension work and in the code of conduct. Uh, and of course, this compendium is one part of that uh, whole body of work. Three important dimensions of the citizens in uniform approach can be emphasized. And I want to talk about each briefly in turn. The equality principle, the rule of law dimension, and the difference principle. The equality principle stresses that members of the military enjoy fundamentally the same rights as other citizens. This notion is reflected in the practice of domestic courts in a number of countries in upholding the constitutional rights of members of the military, uh, for example, in Poland in the Constitutional Court. The equality principle finds a clear echo too in the treatment by the European Court of Human Rights of Article 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights 1950. In its famous Engel decision uh, in 1976, Engel and Netherlands, the court uh, spoke of securing the rights of everyone within the jurisdiction uh, without discrimination as underpinning citizenship in uniform. The equality principle is only one aspect, however. An important second dimension is that members of armed forces are subject to the rule of law. This is an important element both for the common law and the German conceptions. When applied to the human rights of armed forces personnel, it has significant implications. For example, to the right to life, the right not to be sub subject to torture or inhuman or degrading uh, treatment, and the procedural protection of the right of fair trial and to military law. It's the third principle, however, what I call the difference principle, that is the most subtle and challenging. Because after all, soldiers are clearly unlike citizens in one obvious respect. They're trained and authorized to perform violent acts by the state, subject always to military law. As the European Court of Human Rights stated in the Engel case, equality of treatment with other citizens is required subject to what it called the exigencies of military life. What are those distinctive aspects of military life? Well, four can be mentioned. Firstly, the hierarchical structure of the military requiring obedience to lawful orders of superiors. Secondly, operational efficiency in achieving military objectives. And related to that, thirdly, uh, the need for secrecy. And finally, the maintenance of morale or esprit de corps. However, these features also create the risk 
of human rights abuses. For example, the danger of bullying or mistreatment of inferiors and reluctance to report wrongdoing. And when combined with military secrecy, the effect can be, lead, can be to lead to impunity for wrongdoers. This is why the word exigency used by the Strasbourg court is so significant. There's no carte blanche here to restrict the rights of armed forces personnel in the name of uh, military discipline without limits. Rather, it's limited by what is necessary and proportionate in any restrictions on rights that go no further than are required by legitimate military interests. This is the principle also that underlies the approach of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in its comprehensive 2010 resolution on human rights of armed forces. Now, let me give you a couple of examples to illustrate these principles, which you can find in the compendium. First of all, concerning the dangers of politicizing the military. There's a fine balance on the one hand uh, between maintaining the neutrality of the military and its subordination to civil authorities, and on the other hand, interfering uh, with the civil and political freedoms of individual personnel, such as freedom of association, for example. Both interests, of course, are recognized in the OSCE conduct on political military aspects of security. On the one side of the line, a number of countries prevent active service personnel from campaigning or attending political meetings in uniform. These are justifiable restrictions. On the other hand, to deny the right to vote is plainly disproportionate. Different views might be taken about restrictions somewhere in the middle, for example, membership of political parties by service personnel. Many OSC participating states allow this. However, since it doesn't affect, overtly affect military neutrality, but there can be situations where it's un undesirable, such as if the political party is one that undermines constitutional order. And the European Court of Human Rights has endorsed a distinguishing between, between the two in the case of Erdel and Germany that you can find reference to on page 77. There's more detail on all of this in chapter five of the uh, compendium. My second example uh, concerns freedom of expression of service personnel. Now, some limits are undoubtedly necessary uh, because of the risk of insubordination, the possibility of underlining morale, uh, and uh, the risk of disclosing military secrets. And again, cases that have arisen within Europe uh, under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights recognize those important interests uh, as aspects of national security. But they also affirm that they do not justify absolute prohibitions on the free speech of military or security personnel. Clearly, for example, uh, the free use of mobile phones and social media uh, can pose operational dangers in certain situations. And this can justify uh, restrictions as a number of OSCE participating states have recognized. And you can find discussion of that whole question uh, at page 95 of the compendium if you'd like to follow it up. On the other hand, exceptions have to be allowed, for example, for service personnel to raise legitimate concerns about abuses that they see uh, or, 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 uh, or observe, uh, both uh, raising them by internal processes and if those are ineffective uh, to external regulators, exceptionally even uh, to uh, by whistleblowing, uh, as has been recognised uh, in the case of Guja and um, Moldova. You can see that again, discussed in the compendium on page 93. And more, there's more reference, by this way, to this whole question of freedom of expression, a very important one, uh, in, in chapter six of the compendium. Now, these are only by way of very brief examples, of course, of uh, the citizens in uniform approach and much more uh, could, could be said, and there's a great deal more detail discussion of the implications of that uh, in the compendium. I'm happy to respond to any questions or comments uh, later on in our, our session, but for now, thank you uh, for your attention.
Thank you so much, Professor Lee, for really breaking this down and for um, explaining to us uh, this concept of citizens in uniform and also for reconciling uh, that for armed forces personnel, both the principle of equality and of difference applies and how, how this fits together. I found this uh, incredibly um, uh, interesting um, and interesting uh, also or remarkable that a verdict of the European uh, Court of Human Rights uh, has been um, issued as early as 1976 uh, on this issue, but, but still um, it, it seems to be quite a niche issue. And I'm even more happy that, um, that Odir has uh, taken uh, this on together with DCAF and the support of all our uh, viewers. Uh, let me now turn uh, to our second expert speaker uh, with a very, very warm welcome and, and gratitude, uh, Emmanuel Jacob. Um, he is a former member of the Belgian Armed Forces and has been president of Euromil since 2006. Um, for those who are like myself, who are not familiar with what Euromil is, it is an umbrella organization composed of military associations and trade unions. And Emmanuel has authored the chapter on working conditions and support to veterans, which is also a very key component of this compendium. And today he will uh, provide us with some examples of how different rights are applied in the OSE region. And I understand we'll also highlight some key points regarding the non-discrimination principle. Um, Emmanuel, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, first of all, I want to thank also uh, OSE Odir, DCAF, um, for having us here and uh, participating at the launch of this important document, this compendium. Um, it has already been said, um, we had for many years, we worked with the handbook um, and this becomes now a compendium. Um, Euromil worked as well with ODIR as with DCAF, not only on the handbook, but also in the field of uh, the conference of ombuds institutions, together with um, OSC, ODIR, for example, visiting several countries, especially in the Balkan area, working on human rights of military personnel. Um, now this compendium, it matters to military personnel. It's an essential tool to recall that human rights, fundamental freedoms apply to armed forces personnel and this under international standards and legislation. And it must remind OSE participating states of their commitment. Now it's clear that, as already said before, any limitation to the rights of members of armed forces justified by specific nature of the military profession, uh, profession should be interpreted restrictively and surely not serve as justification for imposing blanket bans on rights of military personnel. Now, very often it has been said that military personnel are the backbone of the armed forces and that their voice should be heard. Uh, honestly, I cannot count how many times I heard saying this by ministers of defense in, in the past 20 years, visiting them all around Europe. And I underline that it has been said by ministers of defense but unfortunately not always been done in practice. As already said by, by Ian, soldiers are human beings. They chose to serve their country, but most of all, they are citizens in uniform. And, and the simple fact has already been said that they wear a uniform does not take their rights as a citizen of their country away. Now, Members of the armed forces, military personnel should be involved in the discussion about how their human rights can be safeguarded. Participating will not only improve their level of protection, progress towards democratic armed forces, but also their morale and loyalty, which ultimately contribute to operational effectiveness. And it has already been said several times before once mentioned at this meeting, but at, at many occasions, that the better you have uh, human rights in your daily life, the better you protect these human rights when, for example, you are in a mission abroad. Now, the launch of the compendium 
uh, as said, will not um, bring us to the point of discussing all the details that we have in the many chapters. Um, let's highlight some of them. Of course, and also Ian already came on the point, freedom of association is, at least also for Euromil, but also for military personnel, a quite important issue. Trade unions and professional associations, they are key for the functioning and also necessary for the protection of human rights in the armed forces. Military associations and trade unions are human right defenders, but very often they are not looked at it in this way. Now in several European countries, the right of freedom of association and especially trade union rights are denied or restricted to military personnel. And when allowed to organize themselves, even then very often representatives of military associations face threats, harassment or sanctions. Now, once again, in the compendium, as it was already the case in the handbook before, there is a chapter on military unions and associations, which highlights examples of countries where allowing members of the armed forces to set up and also join, of course, trade unions and professional associations to promote and defend the rights and interests of military personnel. And very important, linked to this established a well-regulated social dialogue. We always want to underline that having the right to join professional associations or military trade unions is one thing, but working with them and really going to collective bargaining and making collective binding agreements, this is still something else. The one is not going without the other. But for us, it's quite normal that military personnel in this way can participate on uh, making agreements and negotiations on their working and living conditions and look for common solutions. For that, there should be a trust between social partners saying the armed forces as an employee, as an employer, sorry, and military personnel as the employees. And this is the case in several European and OSCE uh, participating states countries, but surely not in all of them. Now, in the past years, we had some very important jurisprudence on this case, for example, by the European Commission Social Rights, where we have two important cases. One is Euromil versus Ireland, where trade union rights to military personnel is granted. The second one is CJL versus Italy, where also trade union rights are granted, but even under conditions, the right to strike for military personnel, even if this is not really the topic that we want for, but the point of the case CJL versus Italy is that if finally the social dialogue is not possible, then the ultimate weapon by means of saying should be the right to strike. Now, of course, there are also several other practical examples of how different rights are applied in the USC states in the compendium. One of them has already briefly been touched is the freedom of expression. Uh, something essential to protect members of the armed forces and make sure that their voice is heard. Now, in many countries, and however military personnel do not enjoy their right to freedom of expression, especially when it concerns political issues or in a very limited way. We know, for example, that in some countries, military personnel has almost full right of expression, while in other, they don't have the right to express any political opinion. Now, also being said by Ian is that there is a clear link between freedom of expression and, for example, new modern tools like the social media, smartphones, and, and other ones. Uh, also, whistleblower is, is one of the very important issues that is coming up now, and that surely also in the framework of the military, the military personnel will be discussed. Political right also has already been mentioned. Um, there is a big difference uh, between countries on how to implement political rights for military personnel. But in general, uh, in most of countries, political uh, rights are excluded, meaning active participation of military personnel in political parties. Now, there are other rights. Um, or one of the other rights that perhaps is not so evident 
um, and can even be a surprise for some people, is that with the professionalization of European armed forces, the recognition of the status of conscientious objector to professional soldiers is also becoming an issue. Um, it's, for example, the case in Germany, in Serbia, where this is granted. And also at this point, the companion is coming back um, with um, good experiences um, on this issue. As you already said, Andrea, another issue of importance is equality and non-discrimination. Now, it's clear that OEC participating states, that they committed to prohibit discrimination on any ground. Now, the principles of equality and non-discrimination also apply to armed forces personnel and are therefore addressed in the compendium. Now, the compendium provides an overview of the participating and represent, uh, participation and representation of women, LGBTI people, and individuals from various ethnic, racial, linguistic, religious minorities in the armed forces. But for example, also workplace discrimination is an issue in the armed forces, where military personnel continue to face not only discrimination, but also harassment, uh, harassment, abuse, and violence based on different grounds. Now, in recent talks, for example, we were confronted more and more with the issue of career discrimination, for example, related to participation or not at military missions and operations abroad, or the fact of having or having not participated at certain military courses. Now, it must be clear that diversity and inclusion must also in the armed forces be a matter of human rights, justice and equality, as well as a strategic opportunity to increase operational effectiveness. One of the challenges that armed forces has today is to attract, but especially retain, talented workforce. And therefore, we need to embrace all potential recruits with their various skills and competences. Now, the latter is huge, if not the biggest challenge for today's armed forces has already been said. Efforts should therefore be made to remove barriers to the recruitment and inclusion of everyone within the armed forces. And states should ensure that armed forces are free from discrimination, harassment, abuse, and violence based on different grounds. Now, finally, in this period of COVID-19, right to health. Right to health is important to mention as an issue, not only right to health, but also occupational health and safety. Now the crisis revealed the importance of this matter as well as existing shortfalls. Now we already discussed this topic last year together with DCAF and ODIR, and it showed clearly a need for better protection uh, to health of members of the armed forces in times of crisis and beyond. Now to conclude, we strongly believe that governments should ensure that personnel of their armed forces are treated as citizens in uniform and are able to fully exercise their human rights, fundamental freedoms, both in legislation and in practice. Because this is an important thing, there is a huge difference between writing something down in legislation and regulation and having a mindset in military. Now, therefore, Eurimel recalls that the military cannot function without its human capital. And we insist that taking all measures to protect the defense personnel is vital for collective security. And therefore, Euromil calls on as well political as military leadership to respect their duty of care towards military personnel, including in times of crisis. Now, the latter is a moral duty as well as an obligation under international law. And this is something we should keep reminding over and over again. If I may, may make one final recommendation on, and we launched something today, I want to talk already on the follow-up of this compendium. Two things. First, the follow-up as set by um, the introductory speakers. This needs a follow-up by thematic meetings. This need to be spread out all over the participating states and military organizations. But also it would be very interesting if we could plan already now a revision 
in seven or eight years because times are very, very quickly going on, or perhaps a system where we can make permanent updates online. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Emmanuel, for this uh, um, really a great overview of uh, working conditions, um, non-discrimination, and also the role that uh, trade unions play in the military. Um, I think my colleagues will probably sigh if uh, they have to start with another revision right now. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, it is true that uh, developments are very fast and we will definitely try to keep uh, abreast with the developments. Uh, in the meantime, uh, all the interesting opening remarks and the two uh, presentations from our experts have prompted a whole myriad of uh, questions on the Q&A uh, platform, which we are very, very happy about. We will try to get to as many as possible, but I've been checking with the organizing colleagues that if we don't manage to get through all of them, we'll try to provide some uh, written input as well. Um, there is one that is particularly uh, popular, which I will get to in a second, but uh, one is related actually to military unions and associations, and it fits uh, very well to what Emmanuel just explained. So let me um, use this question first or put this question forward first. Um, I think this is to you, Emmanuel. Um, how would you assess the cooperation and relations between military unions and associations with ministries of defense? but also with external oversight bodies, such as ombud institutions. Well, as already said, I think that um, military associations and trade unions are there to represent military personnel. Um, as military personnel, it will be quite difficult as an individual to go in, in a dialogue. Um, is it about your working conditions, your social social conditions, or is it about the functioning of, of, of your unit? Um, cases of harassment, bullying, uh, whatever is going on, discrimination in, in, in general. Um, so therefore, I believe that there should be, first of all, really representing a representative um, delegates for um, military personnel. Um, the, the relation with ministers of defense or ministries of defense with defense forces leadership, but also with ombuds institutions, institutions for example, I think that this is quite, quite important. Um, trade unionism is not going, and then for some people this can be a surprise, but trade unionism is not going about going permanently in confrontation. Trade unionism is about looking with equal partners for solutions. Solutions to make and to provide good working conditions and good social conditions. Um, and if and when ministers of defense, military leadership, but also the unions from their side, look at each other as equal partners equal social partners, then you have the perfect basis to start this kind of social dialogue. The word is there, social dialogue. But to be able to conduct the dialogue, you should at least be with two to listen to each other and to respect each other. And this, unfortunately, and that's what I said in my statement, it's not the case and it's not everywhere. And it's not something that you can provide only by law. Legislation is one thing and provide the right, the respect and the functioning. That's something else. And this is, yeah, this has to do with, with, with mindset. Uh, the, every time it comes back to the same has to do with mindset. Thank you. Yes, Manuel, a social dialogue cannot order by law uh, <laughs> for sure. Um, the most uh, popular question with the most likes um, is one relating to international missions. And I think it's really interesting. I don't know. Uh, Ian, whether that's one for you, maybe um, uh, give me a sign once I've read out the question. So um, one, uh, well, five our, of our participants would like to know um, how human rights can be respected of armed forces personnel who are engaged in international missions because the human rights um, safeguards in their respective national um, country contexts may differ quite a lot from each other. Um, and there's also a follow-up question on the implications if armed forces, presumably in peacekeeping operations themselves, 
may have been accused of human rights uh, violations? Uh, probably it's a question to both of you. Um, I'm turning to you first, uh, Ian, if I may. So it's, it's a complex and difficult question, I think, isn't, isn't it? Uh, for sure. Um, I mean, of course, many um, uh, operations will, will involve, uh, although they might be um, involved drawing on different countries' armed forces, uh, they'll nevertheless be within the kind of umbrella uh, of, of the OSCE. So, so the common standards that we talk about should apply regardless. Although, you know, of course, there may be uh, specific differences uh, in how those are implemented uh, at, at the national level. I think this gets much more complicated, though, when, when we start to look at, uh, at the involvement of, of, of uh, armed forces from countries outside uh, 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 of the OSC uh, region. Um, I mean, I'd like to believe uh, that we don't um, uh, head for the lowest common standard. But I, I can I can very well see the problems that are behind the behind the question uh, uh, there. Um, the second part was on. Um, can you just just remind me? Sorry, um, it's a tricky function. The mood uh, function. The second part of the question was about um, armed forces personnel who may be in peacekeeping operations, so also international missions but accused themselves of being involved in human rights violations. Yes, well, well you, do, you don't lose your human rights protections because you're, you're a defendant uh, in, in some, some way. Of course, you know, you're still entitled to a fair trial and other, other uh, uh, guarantees. I'm not sure whether that's what was behind the, uh, behind the question, but, but turning it around the other way, I mean, the, a lot of the objective uh, here, uh, certainly underlying the third dimension uh, pillar uh, of, of uh, the uh, ODIS uh, work it, it is that by recognizing uh, the human rights of armed forces personnel themselves, uh, the, you know, this will spill over uh, into a more general appreciation of the human rights of, of, of other people. So, so um, the work we're, we're trying to support it, it, it is to actually work the other way, uh, if that helps. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Certainly, those are complex questions that cannot be answered in a one minute reply, but very, very interesting uh, questions and they will inspire us to keep thinking. Uh, I don't know, Emmanuel, did you have something to add to this question or shall I go on to the next one? I, I can just add well, what, um, what I already said, but, but I would like to remind once again that if military personnel are not granted and cannot have their basic human rights in their day-to-day -day life, yeah, they will never be the best defender of human rights, which is not then uh, the opening to say, okay, you don't care about human rights and just do what, whatever you want. That's very clear. Um, but, but it's by working together and by bringing military personnel together um, that, that you can work on, on, on that and that you, you start also comparing your, your uh, human rights between people together in, in, in a mission. Um, and so the standard, that's very clear, should be the same for everybody. But yeah, also this is saying something and, and we are not able to do this everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, and maybe just to uh, add that, of course, here the um, section of the compendium that deals with the fair trial rights um, of uh, um, armed forces personnel might be um, uh, interesting for mm -hmm. Uh, those participants to read who have, have posed this question. Um, another one which um, <clears throat> has triggered a lot of interest is, um, is this one. Um, filing complaints against superiors is quite difficult in hierarchical systems and instances outside the chain of command often tend to say on paper, even if formally introduced, how could this challenge be addressed? So this is about the difficulty of raising complaints, um, uh, in, in particular if uh, the complaint is against somebody who is higher up in the in the chain of command. Mm. Um, Emmanuel, will you go first this time? Yeah, please. Um, well, well this, this is related directly to um, a good relation and first the existence of ombuds institutions. Um, because they are for the moment, and it depends on the country, 
you have several uh, several systems of, of complaints. You have internal complaint procedures, external ones. You have ombudsman. Uh, you have uh, complaint services. It, it depends a little bit. Um, if, if you read the um, the documents and the reports that has been made by DCAF um, after the ECOAF, uh, several ECOAF meetings, it becomes very clear that also there you have several systems depending on the country. But the relation between, once again, military personnel represented by military associations and trade unions or individually and a good functioning Ombuds Institute, if this is now a general inspector an external ombudsman, an internal ombudsman, whatever, this is very important. It must be possible that military personnel can complain to somebody, it depends on which institution is, in a way that is uh, confidential and that there is a free, not uh, binded by military authority uh, investigation that can go on. And then, of course, the procedure has to, to, to continue its way. Um, but also there, we know that it's not always the case. Um, but the more these services are independent for military uh, hierarchy, the better it is. Thank you so much. Just before I turn uh, to Ian, uh, to uh, let our participants know that from the organizer's point of view, we could extend a little bit because there have been so many interesting uh, questions which we would like to um, get to. But of course, I need to also check with um, Ian and Emmanuel whether they would also be okay uh, to uh, extend the event for 15 mm -hmm. minutes. I see yeah. Ian uh, nodding. Thank you so much. Um, okay, Ian. Uh, um, Oh. Well, uh, just to comment on a different aspect to, uh, uh, to the one uh, raised by, by Manuel, I think one of the questions uh, here uh, is uh, that the military regulations themselves, an example of good practice would be that actually suppressing a complaint or failing to pass it on uh, is itself a disciplinary matter. So uh, this is very complex, of course, but if you if you follow through example uh, in, in chapter 14 of the companion, which deals with um, whole questions of mistreatment, uh, uh, you know, the very grave is that these could be torture, but, but more commonly in human or degrading uh, treatment of, of, of one kind or another. Um, best practice is that actually preventing such a complaint going forwards is itself a disciplinary offence. So, so that works with the grain of the hierarchical nature of the armed forces, I think, which was behind what the question was raising. Uh, in, in, now, of course, it doesn't prevent necessarily things going wrong on the ground, but it, it, it helps to inculcate a culture uh, where complaints have to be taken seriously internally. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Of course, this question relates to the enforcement uh, of the human rights in armed forces personnel, mm -hmm. which we have not gotten to in detail today, but uh, you will find um, a lot of information about this in the compendium. Um, there's another question that has uh, attracted a lot of interest, but it's a bit more complex, for, but so bear with me. Um, I will read it out. Um, evidence demonstrates that conscripts are often used for activities mm -hmm. which are not of a military nature. This is particularly the case in the context of national emergencies where they are often deployed beyond their traditional mandate, such as in the context of uh, COVID-19. How can these issues be better addressed by the international community, given that most national legislation does not elaborate on what exactly is meant mm -hmm. by work of a military nature, mm -hmm. and that conscripts are still exempt from protection under Article 2 of the ILO Convention on Forced Labor? Yes. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can just have a go at this to, to start with then. I'm sure Emmanuel will have, have other things he'll want to, to add. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think that, that's correct, but there, you know, we don't have uh, necessarily in, in national law always those kinds of definitions. But if, if the misuse of conscripts uh, in non-military matters, that certainly is a problem in, in some countries, I, I, I know. Um, if the misuse uh, is, is raised as a legal question, I approach it this way, that, that 
any restrictions on conscripts' rights has to have a legitimate aim. And, and if it's non-military, then there is no legitimate aim. So, so straightforwardly, that they're, they're human rights abuses without even considering uh, whether, whether the, you know, their, their restrictions are, are disproportionate uh, in some way. They just don't have a, a, a proper basis. Um, I'd also say as well that, that um, the chapter of the companion I mentioned before, chapter 14, uh, has a lot to say uh, about um, uh, 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 bullying and harassment of conscripts that's worth looking at, I think. Do you want to add anything, Emmanuel? Mm, yeah, there's, there's not too much I can add. Um, but, but I fully agree with Ian. Um, conscripts or non-conscripts, whatever, everybody who serves in armed forces should be treated in, in a proper way. And human rights are there for everybody. Um, because also conscript um, wearing a uniform or not uh, does not take his, his citizen rights away. Uh, it's a human being and should be treated in this way. Now, um, we, we, as you're a military, we don't have, of course, too much experience anymore with uh, this problem of conscription because there is almost no conscription anymore at the European level um, and where conscription is or still there or coming back because in some countries uh, conscription is coming back in another form more on a free basis um, there we, we we see that these people are in general treated in a proper way or in a way like the other ones and then but we know that in in, in countries and more specifically outside europe um, that uh, conscripts are very often used as, um, yeah, um, cannon meat, as sometimes has been said in the past, unfortunately. But also this we need to fight. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, since we talked about um, states of emergency and the role of military there, uh, let me pick up another uh, question which interests uh, a couple of our participants. Um, have you observed some new types of violations of the rights of armed forces personnel since the COVID-19 outbreak? So some of, uh, I think the content of the previous question plays a little bit into this, to what extent military personnel is, um, is, is used to work to address uh, such an emergency, but are there any other new issues that have arisen in your uh, observation? I think Emmanuel might be better placed to, to tackle this than, than me. He's probably got a sure sense of what's going on on the ground just at the moment. When, um, when, when you look, of course, due to the, the current situation, um, armed forces, military personnel, since now March last year involved in the, in the, in the pandemic and in fighting the pandemic, um, now it, it's clear that from the start, and this was also the, the subject of the discussion that we had together with DCAF and ODIR, is, uh, was um, looking at, okay, suddenly, uh, suddenly just, just like other services, but also military personnel has been engaged in, in a role and in, uh, and in a function which was not really their day-to-day -day thing and, and, and something that they were always trained for. Um, has it now to do with human rights directly? Yes, because the right to health is, is related to human rights. Um, but it, it's clear that military personnel, but for example, also police personnel uh, was faced with, with quite some problems, um, but also problems related to or personal equipment, protective equipment mm -hmm. that uh, was lacking um, if you look, for example, to, to the police, which, which is not really my area, but there were, for example, discussions on the fact that policemen on the street at the start of the pandemic were not allowed to wear masks. Um, and I, I, these are discussions that, that are a little bit surprising at a certain moment, um, but in one way or another are related to, to human rights. And, and um, But um one of the biggest problems was of course also the influence on armed forces and on armed forces personnel 
Um, but once again, right to health is a human right. Um, and, and at a certain moment, as said, military personnel is engaged in something where they are not always trained for. If you look, for example, and I, I always use the case of, of Italy because this is something that stays on my, my image and you can find these videos on, on YouTube. At a certain moment, Italian military personnel was engaged in transport of people died of COVID-19. And, and you saw these images of not one truck, but a column of trucks, many military trucks, one after the other, leaving the hospital, driving in one road to the cemetery, going into the cemetery where people were buried without that the family was present, without that nothing was present. It was a kind of, yeah, not in mass graves, but it was almost like this. Well, I'm convinced that something like this stays in your mind. Um, and, and perhaps people can say, this is not, yeah, this is not an operation and you are trained to go in operation and in mission. Well, this is something else. Because at the same moment that these people not trained for things like mm -hmm. this are driving to the cemetery, they have a family back home that is also facing COVID-19 at the same moment. So you have this, this double impact of doing the job, not knowing how things are going with your family and an enormous stress on being away from home. Um, if you go in a mission, you know you are gone for four months and, and then it's hard for some of them. It's very hard. But in these cases, people left home, started an internal mission, did not, what, did not know what they could expect and were facing that meanwhile their families were somewhere there around and they could not help them, not protect them. And these are things that we all should, also should um, bear in mind when we talk about human rights, military personnel. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm just looking at the time and even though we have uh, extended, we need to uh, come to a conclusion at some point because we have two um, final uh, remarks as well lined up. But let me ask one last one, which is um, very different again from the ones that we previously had. So uh, one is about a retired high ranking officer and to what extent the fact that uh, such a person would have secret information means that they are prohibited from engaging in politic, uh, politics uh, at the end or after their retirement. Are there any kind of standards or guidelines on, on this question? Hmm. I think I'd want to, if I can start, I think I'd want to, to differentiate two aspects of that. Um, uh, th there's not much, I don't think, justification for um, preventing uh, retired military personnel uh, from uh, participating in politics, even standing for high office. And I'm sure uh, that, the, um, that the guidance and the principles are on my side when I say that. However, uh, on the second aspect, um, uh, I do think, uh, I'm sure, and equally, you know, human rights law will support restrictions on, on disclosing secrets uh, uh, that, that can um, uh, uh, damage national security. So, so no blanket restriction on uh, on political on engaging in political uh, activities or, or, or higher office at all uh, but yes specific narrow restrictions could well be justified even punishable by criminal law sure mm -hmm. emmanuel anything to add Ab absolutely but but this is not only for the military why why yeah. should this be strictly for the military there are quite some people that uh, have have information um on whatever things uh, but, uh, but also influencing national security uh, due to their job, even coming from the private sector. Um, so why should this especially be for the military, as of everybody who was in the military, and especially high ranking, that they know, I don't know which kind of secrets. Um, so I think it, it's quite clear that, yeah, they, they, once you step out um, or you go to politics or to something else, there are things that remain confidential and, and secret, and, and that's it. Um, but just to make the last remark on political rights, I don't even see a reason why somebody in active service should not be engaged in, in, in politics. The thing is that you should be able to make the distinction between the military and politics. 
but this is the same for a judge. This is the same for a teacher. Um, this is the same for somebody leading DCAF. Um, you lead DCAF, and if you do politics afterwards, well, um, do politics afterwards, but don't mix both of them. Um, and if you do then politics and you are in the military, well, then you should provide in, um, in political leave and so that people at a certain moment can go in another direction. And it would be a good thing for armed forces if we had more people engaged in politics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's one last question, which I do want to pick uh, in light of the International Women's Day uh, on Monday. Um, here it is. Uh, military trade unions and associations promote and safeguard human rights and gender equality within the armed forces. Do you believe that there's room for strengthening their actions, especially the gender equality at the international level and how? If, if I may, um, yes, this should be done. Um, this is in progress. Um, but um, there need to, to, we need to get all collaboration possible. Um, meaning as well from the military as from society. Um, here also, once again, it's not enough to provide regulation and legislation. It's needed that things happen in practice. Um, now, more and more, this uh, whole gender discussion uh, has its place as well in the unions as in the military. Um, we have, for example, in, in, um, in about two weeks, uh, the 18th, if I'm not mistaken, we have a, a, a noon discussion um, on this issue. Uh, these discussions happen quite often um, so the, this point is, is coming on the table more and more, um, but we cannot deny that, that armed forces uh, still have a low average of, of a low number, sorry, of uh, female military personnel. Um, this has to do with, with recruitment norms, uh, th but this has also to do with, thank God, not in all, uh, but in several armed forces where you still have uh, a strong yeah, male, um, male factor playing a role uh, and not always respecting women in the proper way that they should do. Uh, but it's very clear that the gender discussion and that women in armed forces and in military operations uh, has an advantage and a positive factor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emmanuel. Anything uh, to add uh, from you, Ian? On no, I'll do that, I think, yes. Thank you so much uh, for all these interesting questions. I think it just shows uh, the wealth of, of complexity, but also the, the high interest. And I can see that even though we have uh, gone over in time, and most of the participants have borne with us. So thank you for your patience and interest, really. Um, we have a lined up at the end uh, of our uh, webinar. Um, two uh, closing remarks, which I think is really great to not um, end an event with uh, loose ends, uh, but to have somebody wrap it up for us. And uh, one uh, thing that I want to introduce this with is that for the OSCE, uh, what makes the issue of human rights in the armed forces particularly compelling is that it combines, as our director has mentioned, the first dimension of the OSCE with the third dimension. And of course, in light of the uh, chairpersonship in office of uh, uh, Sweden currently, we hope that this will also be supported in, in, in the events during this year. Uh, but uh, with this, let me hand over to uh, our um, uh, closing speakers from the delegation of Finland, um, who cover both the first and the third dimension uh, issues um, at the OSCE level. Uh, and I'm calling first on the first secretary of the delegation, Sebastian Ganström, and then secondly on the military advisor, Colonel Thomas Aljoko. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank yours. you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. And as we talked about gender equality and parity, uh, the last thing we did, I'm, I'm afraid that we will continue our concluding remarks with two, two male speakers. But uh, then again, I can assure you we're almost the only males at the, at the Finnish delegation. So 
So uh, in that in that sense, some kind of gender balance. But thank you, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, thank you so much to Odir and Dikef for for your excellent work in compiling this this compendium and and, and also for arranging this event. And and a big thank you to 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 Emmanuel and, and, and Ian also for the very interesting discussion where uh, which I, at least I learned um, a lot a lot of new things and and discussion has been very lively, which is always great at these events. Um, we as Finland are very happy to have been given the opportunity to uh, to support uh, this process um, and and also for for being able to say a few concluding remarks. Uh, I will say something general from the from the uh, third dimension perspective and then hand over to my my colleague to talk uh, talk more uh, in practical terms about the the Finnish um, experience. Um, as you mentioned, Andrea, uh, this is a, a good example of how you combine. Uh, first uh, uh, third dimension uh, issues in the first dimension and as a colleague of mine said this sounds like an x-files episode but this is actually very much uh, reality uh, and and this kind of cross-cutting uh, approach is also very very welcome uh, i think this is also uh, goes to show uh, what the comprehensive concept of security that the osc has means and <clears throat> can mean in practice this is a good example of that the reason why we uh, as finland found it important to to uh, support this process is of course because human rights are universal uh, but still the human rights of the armed forces themselves or the armed forces personnel, it's not an issue that has received a lot of attention. Um, and this is despite the fact that this is crucial, not only for the military, of course, but for society as a whole. Um, soldiers are citizens, um, citizens in uniform, I think Professor uh, Lee explained very eloquently here earlier. Um, and uh, the armed forces are subject to democratic oversight. Um, so this places responsibility both on, on the societies and on the armed forces. I think at the OSC, we, we do talk a lot about the responsibility of the armed forces to ensure the human rights of civilians throughout the whole conflict cycle. Um, but uh, we um, uh, have not talked so much about the human rights of, of the armed forces personnel themselves. And, but I think it's fair to say, as we've heard today, that, that the better the um, armed forces personnel have their own human rights safeguard, the more uh, they will be also um, incentivized to uh, safeguard the human rights of, of civilians. So the closer the armed forces are to the rest of society, the better for the whole of society. Um, just uh, to finish off, for, for Finland, of course, human rights are at the core of our foreign policy. Um, and uh, that is why we are also now uh, um, available for, for the Human Rights Council for the next period of 2022 to 24. And this, this will be an opportunity for us to show in practice what it means to uh, have our longstanding commitment to human rights uh, in foreign and security policy. Uh, now this concerns, of course, also the armed forces of Finland. And now I would like to hand over the, uh, the, the screen to my, my colleague uh, Tuomas, who will mention some examples of how political, social and cultural rights are safeguarded in the Finnish armed forces. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for an excellent event. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to have the closing uh, remarks and conclusions. At first, I have to say that I found the discussions and questions and answers very interesting and thought provoking. I've been serving 30 years in Finnish Defense Forces. I haven't been paying too much attention to these topics. They are almost self evident in our society. This topic is part of the OSCE Code of Conduct on Political Military Aspects of Security. When we talk about confidence building measures, then we usually think about the hard aspects of security. It is important to remember that these soft aspects, so-called soft aspects, the human aspects of security, can be as important for building con uh, confidence. Now I raise a, question, raise a question which I won't answer. Would there be scope for including the human aspects more closely in the Code of Conduct discussion in the Forum for Security Cooperation? I will point out some examples from, from Finnish Defense Forces concerning the human rights and fundamental freedoms of armed forces personnel. Respecting the human, social and economic rights of armed forces personnel is important also for the effectiveness of the organization. One example is human intelligence. For instance, in peace building missions, it is essential to analyze the operating environment correctly, which requires personnel from different backgrounds cultures and regions. Currently, Finnish Defence Forces are recruiting women to special operations forces to take part, in, uh, part into international operations to broaden the gender aspect. The current time, the democratic oversight 
and also neutrality in the eyes of our citizens. Finnish defense forces are separated from policy and decision makings, making. According to annual service, our defense forces are among the most trusted authorities. Only police and frontal guard are above us. Our defense staff is an independent organization in defense forces. Ministry of Defense is an own independent organization taking care of the resources and defense policy aspects. President of the Republic of Finland is the supreme commander of the Finnish defense forces. His direct subordinate is the chief of defense. What comes to political parties, as mentioned a couple of times already during the discussions, professionals in active duty are not allowed to be members of political parties. Neither think they can be a member of parliament or minister. They can still be independent members in the municipal councils if elected. I can tell also from my personal uh, background that I have been a candidate a couple of times to municipal council from the list of independent candidates. Concerning the elections, Finland will conduct the next municipal elections next month. To ensure the democratic process, we try to make voting from abroad as easy as possible, so that serving in international operation wouldn't be an obstacle to taking part in the democratic process. For example, if there is no Finnish embassy nearby, or the security situation is analyzed to be too fragile, we have organized local polling stations to our contingents. Thus, already discussed many times in this uh, compendium, military personnel have the right to be members to trade unions and other associations that are safeguarding their rights. For example, Officers Union was founded in 1918 and turned to actual trade union during 1930s. Non-discrimination in the armed forces also relates to the concept of mission readiness and the responsibility to protect, to protect one's country. As Finland is a bilingual country, one brigade is dedicated as a Swedish-speaking unit, and for our national minority, Sami people, are mother tongue forms available. Uh, particularly in countries with strong dividing lines in society, having armed forces, in which only one culture is represented, might even put social peace at risk. Women has had the possibility to seek the conscript service on a voluntary basis from 1995 on. Nowadays, there are no restrictions concerning the tasks women can perform. It's based on the requirements and how one can fulfill them. Currently, the highest ranking female officer is Lieutenant Colonel, and the careers of female officers warrant officers and non-commissioned officers develop in a normal pace, the same route as the men officers and uh, NCOs, according to service years and competence. For person with a conscientious objection based on religious or ethical grounds, we have the possibility to civilian non-military service or unarmed military service. Annually, approximately 2,000 men choose the civilian non-military service. If the armed forces are very divided, the unit cohesion is not an, optional, uh, not an optimal level. This might have a drastic effect to capability. Also on this basis, we started a test, inspired partly by the good results from our Western neighbor Sweden, to accommodate women and men voluntary to same accommodation rooms in barracks. And the results are promising. At the end, I would like to prefer, refer a part from our military oath or affirmation, which every soldier gives. In my opinion, it represents very well part of the code of conduct and human rights from the aspect of command. It also shows that human rights have been recognized in the Finnish Defense Forces already many decades ago. If I will be vested with command authority, I want to be fair to my subordinates, take care of their well being, gain information of their wishes, be their advisor and guide, and from my own side, try to act as a good and encouraging example to them. All of this I want by my honor and conscience. Uh, fulfill.
The military oath was written 1965, long before the Code of Conduct. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much uh, to our speakers from Finland for rounding up the event and for reminding us that, of course, the respect for the human rights of uh, armed forces personnel is in the very interest uh, of the military. Um, it leaves me to thank our fabulous experts um, uh, for answering uh, all questions for the very concise and illuminating uh, summaries that they provided to our uh, introductory speakers for putting the big uh, context and to our closing speakers for uh, rounding it all up for us. Uh, I want to thank particularly the translators who have been able to bridge uh, the language gap. Uh, I hope we were not speaking too fast and thank you so much for staying with us longer than uh, initially planned. Um, I want to thank all participants for your interest, for your very, very interesting questions. Uh, and I hope that we uh, can stay in touch with you um, to uh, see how uh, you can apply the compendium, what other questions may arise, and our colleagues will display um, email contacts to be in touch with us um, later on. Uh, I want to thank again uh, Will and Yona and all the other uh, staff who have been involved in putting the compendium together, uh, the supplementary uh, documents and this event. And if I would um, have to summarize what we have heard here today, and what um, kind of uh, makes the, the compendium is that uh, armed forces personnel are, as we heard, citizens in uniform, and they have equality of rights, even though there are certain differences. Uh, but as a kind of old fashioned human rights lawyer, this is really not uh, very different from all other human rights considerations, where simply uh, there are certain limitations for uh, most uh, human rights on the basis of lawfulness, necessity, and proportionality. And that is simply uh, also true for the human rights of armed first, uh, forces personnel. Uh, Odier takes uh, very seriously the mission to protect the human rights of everyone. Uh, and I hope the compendium um, uh, bears witness um, of this, that we're not leaving out the human rights of armed forces. Uh, I hope you found it interesting today. This was just a teaser. Uh, you have 351 pages uh, of more information. Uh, if you're interested, stay in touch with us. And um, thanks again for your interest and support. And all the best of luck and health to you.